Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome back to Inside Arsenal. It is Wednesday. I hope the week is going well, wherever you're watching or listening to this around the world. Slap bang in the middle of what is now officially a heatwave over here in England. One that's going to end tomorrow though, so short but sweet. But you know us Brits, we love to complain about the weather, whether it's too cold or too hot. And today it is definitely too hot. Hot, but still plenty to talk about when it comes to football. Definitely going to round up last night's international action. What another miserable night that was for England. But hey, we're through. We won the group. So something positive, at least. We've got to talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about what else happened. Uh, William Sleeve in action yesterday. Yaku Kivio in action as well. We're going to talk about Eddie Nketiah and this £50 million price tag that everyone has been talking about in the last 24 hours or so. I did talk about it in yesterday's live show. Saw lots of you sending in questions about it and hadn't actually seen any of the reports at that point. So I was a bit confused, but been uh, looking at them today. So we'll talk about that and give my thoughts on potential £50 million price tag for Eddie and Ketia. We'll talk about uh, Sa Saru Girassi, who's been linked with Arsenal once again. Apparently he's informed Stuttgart that he is going to be leaving the club this summer. There is a very tempting release clause on him. 28 goals in 28 games last season. We'll talk about that. Got some questions and comments from you guys as well. But let's start, shall we, with Eddie Inketia. £50 million. If you're reading on the internet, if you're looking on News Now, Arsenal, you'll see plenty of headlines right now about £50 million for Eddie Inketia because, according to some reports, that is the price tag that Arsenal have slapped on his head. His interest in Eddie Inketia this summer, West Ham, long-term admirers of Eddie Inketia, Crystal Palace, even longer-term admirers of uh, Nketiah Fulham as well, linked with him just like they are with Emil Smith-Rowe. £50 million, pounds, apparently, is what Arsenal are asking for. Now, I haven't had this confirmed by anyone at Arsenal, I have to say, um, but I don't know, I'm not, I can't, I'm not doubting these stories by any means, they've obviously come from somewhere, but um, I, I would, and look, I am not underselling Arsenal players. I know I see all your comments all the time. I'm always undervaluing Arsenal players and all that sort of stuff. And I don't think I really do. I think I try and put a realistic viewpoint on what I think the club could get. Um, and I'm going to do that with Eddie. And I don't think 50 million is realistic <laughs> to me. And I think Arsenal should get good money for Eddie Nketiah. Don't get me wrong. I think he's a really good striker. I think he's Premier League proven. Of course, he's English. He's still young. Only just turned 25. I can't believe Eddie Nketiah is 25, by the way. Um, but he has only just turned 25. So he's not at, yet at his prime. Got a few years left on his contract. So Arsenal need to be getting, if they do sell Eddie this summer, they need to be getting good money for him. I just think 50 million is perhaps a little bit above the expectation um you know i think if arsenal get 30 to 35 million for eddie and ketia this summer i think you have to look at that and think that's a pretty good amount of money um if he does go you know if they can get 50 million absolutely fantastic if someone's going to pay that i just I, I would be very surprised if a premier league club puts the money that sort of money down on the table for Eddie, I think 30 to 35 million is a lot more realistic. I mean, I've seen some of you guys in the comments before saying just give them away for, for whatever, which I think is just mad because, he, as I've listed, the reasons just listed, he's a good player, he's Premier League proven, can score goals in the Premier League, he's shown that before, he's still young. Um, and so, yeah, sort of giving him away or giving him away really cheaply just doesn't make any sense to me. Arsenal need to be getting good money from Eddie if they do sell him. 50 million. I don't think that's realistic. Let me know your thoughts, though, in the comments below. Do you think Arsenal have a realistic chance of getting £50 million pounds for Eddie and Ketchup? Do you think that's a price tag uh, that is just a step too high for the 25-year-old striker? Love to get your views. And look, he didn't have the best of seasons last season. He started very, very well. He scored some goals. I mean, this picture, if you're watching on YouTube, was from that hat-trick he scored against Sheffield United, was it? Really good hat-trick as well um, for Eddie. And he was scoring a few goals the first half of the season. His performances dipped in the second half of the season. Um, I think Mikel sort of lost a bit of trust in him as well. Didn't start to use him anywhere near as much. Of course, Kai Havertz was suddenly the the number nine when Jesus was out. Trossard was playing at number nine. Now, Eddie was very much sort of last 10 minutes type substitute if Arsenal needed a goal. And that's the sort of category he fell into in the second half of the last season. But he did still prove in those first few months that he can score goals. And he's shown that since he's come into the Arsenal squad anyway, that he can score at Premier League level. Um, and I think I think he'll be of interest to a lot of clubs. 
I just don't think 50 million is realistic. But let me know your thoughts on it all in the comments below. Okay, from one striker to another, Sehu Girassi, um, always sort of mentioned as a potential Arsenal target, um, has now informed Stuttgart, according to reports in Germany, that he is going to be leaving this summer. There's lots of interest in him. He's got a very, very nice release clause of, I think it's 17 million for non-German clubs. It's less than that for German clubs. And Borussia Dortmund are very much pushing for Girassi. And the expectation has been for a while that that is where he is going to go. I think they can get him for about 15 million. But for non-German clubs, it goes up a couple of million to 17 million. He scored 28 goals in 28 games last season. Um, in Germany, only Harry Kane scored more, I think, across Europe's top five divisions than him. Um, and so on paper, when you look at that and you look at the numbers and you look at a price tag of potentially 17 million, it feels like a very tempting proposition for clubs. The thing with Girassi is he's 28. You know, I don't want to say journeyman because that's a bit harsh, but he's been he's been around Europe for a while. And like last season, he really sort of exploded into life with that, that record of 28 in 28. Hadn't really shown that before. Um, had scored goals, but hadn't really showed, you know, scoring at that sort of rate and that sort of level before. I mean, that's not to say that last season was a one-off. Sometimes strikers just improve as they get older. Look at Olivier Giroud, you know, as he got older, he, you know, he's just got better and better and better and a more rounded striker. Maybe that's what's happening for Guracy. But if you're selling Eddie and Ketia, if you're Arsenal and you're selling Eddie, and I've always said, if you sell Eddie, you have to replace him. You can't just sell Eddie and then not replace him. But if you do get some good money for Eddie, whether it be 50 million or not, but if it's more likely 35 million, you know, you could spend half of that on someone like Girassi. And that's your sort of backup stroke striker, another option, stroke, stro um, another option from the bench, potentially or starting spot, depending on how he comes in and performs. So it would be a tempting thing for Arsenal. But the expectation remains in Germany that Dortmund is the most likely option. Milan are also said to be sniffing around, but Dortmund remained the most likely option. Um, for Giracy. But yeah, certainly one to keep an eye on maybe as the next couple of weeks progresses. 17 million, quite tempting, it has to be said, for that sort of price, I have to admit. A lot, of you, a lot. I'm sure many more of you are uh, more... So I can't get my words out. I went down the pub yesterday for the England game, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and I'm struggling a little bit today. Certainly showing my age, hung over a little bit. Um, and I've totally lost my train of thought of what I was just talking about for Giracy. But that was it. I'm sure plenty of you are know far more about him than me and you've watched watched him far more than I have. So if you've watched him, you're a keen observer of the Bundesliga, let me know your thoughts on Girassi and whether he could be a decent option for Arsenal in the transfer window if they are looking to bring in a replacement potentially for Eddie Nketiah if he does indeed move on. OK, talking about the England game then, as I said, I was down the pub watching it last night. I had a really good night, aside from the football, obviously. <laughs> it was one of those nights that you went down to watch the football, but as it wore on, you just spent more and more time not even really looking at the screen. You were just talking to your mates and having a laugh because every time you looked at the screen, you're just like, oh, it was another really poor England performance. Um, they weren't great. No goals. I mean, they, were, they didn't give Slovenia anything really at the other end. They were pretty hard to beat. They were watertight and so they got themselves a point, another clean sheet. But going forward, there continues to be continues to be problems for England. I think the front four just aren't firing. Foden, Saka, Kane, Bellingham were all pretty poor, I thought, last night. No one played well. I thought Declan Rice played pretty well, to be fair to him. Um, and like I said, the defenders sort of did their jobs. But uh, in going forward, something needs to change for England, I think. If they're, if they're not going to go out with a whimper in the first knockout round, which I really do believe they will at the moment, unless something happens that sparks them into life, then I just think Southgate needs to change it. There's been a lot of talk today. I've got some comments here from Ian Wright about Bukayo. Um, he says, as great as Saka has done for England in terms of what he creates and his goals and assists, he is a natural left-sided player. He started playing for England on the left at youth level. He started at Arsenal on the left. If that's going to give you the balance and you can get Cole Palmer into the team, on the right, it's something you have to at least look at. Yes, Carl Walker can play at left back. It's the same situation where you have players coming inside. You have no one going around. He's a natural left footer, Saka. We could activate the whole left-hand side. And he's not the only person I've seen say that. I saw Gary Neville suggesting it. I mean, we're talking about moving Bukaya Saka to left back here. I don't agree with that. I, I had no issue moving him 
to the left wing for a game. Because as I said, I think Southgate needs to change something pretty drastically and not just make one change, not just do Conor Gallagher for um, Trent Alexander-Arnold and think that was going to solve all England problems. Of course it wasn't. It was, that was never going to happen. And the fact that he hooked Gallagher after 45 minutes just showed what a farce of a decision that was. But he needs to change more than just one player because it's clearly not working for England. The front four aren't firing. They all look unfit. They all look out of form or they all are out of form. So you've got to change things a little bit. And you know, I, I do think bringing Cole Palmer in on the right-hand side, potentially for Saka, is something that he probably should look at. Saka hasn't been great. No one else has, but Saka hasn't been great. But I kind of like the idea of having Saka on the left wing. I don't like him at left-back. He's, left, he's not a defender anymore. He did that when he was a kid. He's not that anymore. So I just play him on the left-hand side of the wing where Foden's playing. I think you do that. That's, I'd absolutely change Ollie Watkins for Harry Kane. I don't know how Kane stayed on the pitch yesterday. He was just awful once again. And I would really, for whoever it's going to be in the next round, whether it be Holland or, or whoever it's going to end up being, I just think the most, the best thing you can do is probably at the moment to sparking, try and spark England into something different. Play Palmer on the right. I'd have Ollie Watkins up front as a striker. I'd have Saka on the left-hand side and I'd have Foden behind him uh, in the number 10. And I'd have Bellingham and Rice as the midfield too. He's never going to do that, of course, but I really feel like that is a pretty decent option for England right now because something has to change. They're not playing well. They're not going to go far in the competition. The worst thing is they've got a really good draw through to the final. They're on the right side of the draw. They've got a nice run. If they were playing well and their big players were in form, they'd have a really good opportunity to get into the final. But unfortunately, they're so out of form. I just don't see any way that they get through the knockout stages at the moment unless Southgate does something, anything, just to try and jolt them into life. And whether that means moving Bukayo over to the left-hand side whatever, just something needs to happen to try and spark them into life because at the moment they are going to go out and they're going to go out with a whimper. It has to be said. William Saliba played yesterday in the uh, battle of the Arsenal defenders. It was France versus um, Poland. So Saliba versus Kivior. It ended all square, just like England, really. France not playing well. You know, you could sort of look at this tournament and the favourites going into it. Probably France and England were the two favourites, certainly over in this country. Both have been really, really underwhelming so far. You could say the same um, about a couple of other sort of highly fancy teams. Holland have been really, really poor. But um, Kivio gave away a penalty in the game yesterday that Mbappe scored from. But then Apamakano also gave away a penalty. And Lewandowski at the second attempt made it 1-1 and got a draw for Poland, which means that Austria went and won that group, which is when you think of, you had France and Netherlands. Uh, the fact that Austria went on and won that group, fair play to them. Been playing some really, really excellent football, Austria as well. The sort of football I'm just watching them playing at the moment, just dreaming of England playing something like that. I've got a question here or a comment here from Augustine uh, from is that Ghana via the America, judging by the flags. He said, just watched England play today and they were awful. Yes, they were. The midfield is packed with zero creativity. Jude and Foden cannot play together as they seem to have similar roles. Dropping Grealish was such a gamble, such a bad gamble, as he's far better equipped to play on the wings than Foden. I've totally forgotten about Grealish, I have to say. But when I was reading this comment, it just reminded me of Southgate's decision and that he hadn't played well this season for Manchester City. But I have to admit, having the option of playing Grealish right now, given how this tournament is going, would be quite a nice option to have. He said, Jude plays with speedy wingers at Madrid, so why doesn't Southgate mimic that diamond formation with Jude as a false nine and flanked by Saka and Gordon? England won't make it to the semis with this setup. I agree. It's exactly what I've been saying. He needs to change it, not just one personnel change. He needs to change the whole thing, really shape things up, try and spark them into life. He says, OK, now Arsenal, I think we should be looking at Savio on loan from Girona. The kid can ball and he's a nightmare on the wings for Brazil. I also think we should sell, sign João Gomes from Wolves and Zubamendi this summer. They are upgrades to Jorginho and Party. I like Anana and Fafana, but I think those two, I like those two way more. We need to fill the, fix the gaps in midfield. We need younger legs to break down any other counters. Unfortunately, Savio is off to Manchester City, isn't he? He's um City, he's part of place with Girona, which is a City group, and uh, I think that's already a done deal. I thought it was already a done deal anyway that he's off to Manchester City this summer, which is a uh, yeah is a shame because he looks like a very very good player and he's going to be another really good attacking option for Manchester City if that deal does go through, which I'm pretty sure it has. I haven't double checked it, but I thought it, that was all done and dusted. Uh, João Gomez and the Zuba Mendy, obviously we know all about Zuba Mendy and Arsenal's long-term interest in him, whether they can actually convince him to leave after the Euros. We'll have to wait and see. He's already said that he won't, he's not going to do anything in terms of his future until the Euros is over with Spain. João Gomez, done well for Wolves, 
certainly um, had a decent enough season for them. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good. I've not really seen too many people mention him as a possibility this summer. Uh, but you could be the first. Who knows? Let me know anyway if you're watching. If you agree that Jao Gomez would be a good signing, thank you very much, Augustine, for that. Josh now has gone in touch and said, "I've just finished watching the Netherlands and Austria game." First point is having to laugh at United. This Austria team have been one of the best at the Euros and watching Rangnick succeed while United have struggled since he left gives me a good laugh. Yeah, absolutely. As I was saying, Austria have been absolutely brilliant. Real breath of fresh air this this tournament. He said, my second point is Javi Simons. He was the best player on the pitch for the Dutch today and I'm convinced he would be great for us. If all PSG want is 50 million, then I think it's a no-brainer. Cheers from Milwaukee in the US. I don't think PSG want 50 million. I don't think they want to sell. I think that's the... Uh, that's what's coming out of Paris anyway, is that they have no interest in selling. They will let him go on loan again, and he wants to go on loan again. He's already informed PSG that, but they have no intention to sell. Obviously, a big bid could change their thinking, um, but the likelihood at the moment is he's going to go back to Germany on loan to Leipzig or Bayern Munich. Bayern Munich are very much pu pushing to have Xavi Simons for a season, so I'm not sure You know, Arsenal is a real possibility at this stage for him, but yeah, he certainly looks... Uh, He's caught the eye, he certainly caught the eye yesterday anyway, in that Dutch game, which was a cracking game. Austria won 3-2. Uh, Ash now says, Hi Charles, if the reports are to be believed, Eze could well be the battle of the transfer window for some of the big six. If it does come down to, to it and we make a move for him, you think Arsenal will be in a very strong position with both club and player, seeing as we can offer a direct replacement for him, who we know Palace want. Presumably talking about Emil Smith Rowe there, uh, and given Eze's links to Arsenal anyway, can't help but think this is a sign in that would elevate our football. For all the talk of Martinelli in his poor season, he had no stability on the left hand side, no meaningful partnerships. Just imagine the season he could have with a player like Eze in that left eight, drawing so many players into him. Gabby plus space to run equals money. If we do sign him, watch this space, Gabby and Eze. Um, yep, can't really, can't really uh, say too much. Else on that, I agree. I spoke about it as they said, I think it'd be a really sharp sign. A lot of people have got into the comments um, in the last couple of days on the video saying, oh, why as they can't play as a in the centre, he's much more of a winger. See, I don't I don't agree with that at all. I think as they can absolutely play as a centre. I think, and I think he's shown that for Crystal Palace that he's good in the central areas. I don't I at least say I viewed as a more of a winger. Um, but I think as they can absolutely play in the central area, and I think he's proven that already. I mean, his quality is he's versatile, so he can play across the front line if needed, but I think he can play as a left eight, and I think um, I think that's a position he could really grow into if, and he's a big if, he does end up moving this summer to Arsenal. Tottenham, apparently, as well, very, very keen on Eze. Like you say, Ash, I think it could be a bit of a battle once the uh, Euros are done and dusted. Sam here. I think this is the last one. It is. Sam says, I love that they've got the players out there doing that. Now, this is a response to what I was talking about in yesterday's show, that Arsenal have gone out to Marbella or, or it's a group of six Arsenal players right now are out in Marbella with Mikel Arteta. That's Emil Smith-Rowe, Rhys Nelson, Eddie Nketiah, Yuri and Timber, Ben White, and someone else who I've totally forgotten at the moment. I'm sure you can all remind me in the comments who the other player is who's gone out there. It's all the non-internationals uh, who are out there at the moment. They're doing this training camp. It's not official pre-season. It's like a pre-pre-season. So they're going out there, having this training camp with Arteta and the coaching staff, working just really hard on their fitness, just for a little sort of select time in the day. The rest of the time is their free time. So it's not like they're in a, you know, sort of proper pre-season environment. It's more like a holiday, but just for a select period of the day, they have got a training session. Then they can go out. They've got their families there. They can do what they want. It's their own free time. There's no restrictions or anything like that. So it's a kind of holiday, holiday stroke training camp. And I don't think it was compulsory. As far as I'm aware, it wasn't compulsory for these players because preseason had started yesterday. The opportunity was there to do it. And these players all said, yeah, I wanna, I'm want i up for doing that. So they've gone over there. Odegaard's going to join. Party's going to join next week, I believe. And... Gabriel Jesus as well is going to be heading over there to join up with the six that are already there. So I spoke about that all yesterday. Uh, Sam's got in touch, says, I love that they've got the players out there doing that. Saves the players, paying some third party out there to train them. Do it with the club. Best for everyone involved. The players get more game time and the coaches and a chance to show the club why to keep them around. It's a good point because we see it lots and lots of times. Players do sort of hire their own personal fitness coaches during the summer and they always upload it to Instagram, don't they? Showing them somewhere in a place like Marbella or, or something like that. Uh, where they're doing the, this fitness work. But this time it gives them the opportunity, as Sam says, to be around a sort of club environment or the staff environment working with them. And for some of these players, it's really, you know, Smith Rowe, Nelson, 
Eddie, their futures are very much up in the air. And if they do really want to prove to Arteta and Mikel that they want to stay at Arsenal, then this is a good opportunity for them to really do that. So I agree, Sam. I think it's a really good idea. I think it's different. As I was saying yesterday, I've never really known Arsenal do anything like this before. Um, so I think it is different, but I think it's a good idea. And uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they get on. Right, that's it from me, everyone. Thank you very much for your time. As always, I hope I didn't struggle too much. Like I said, hangover kicking in, feel my age a little bit this morning. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow to do it all over again. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. 